Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Diamond Ray of Disappearance, an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, produced by Filmation Studios. So yeah, here we are with the pilot episode of the series. Although it is somewhat confusingly the fourth episode of the series. This is because even though it was the first episode produced and intended to air first, it was actually the fourth script approved. So, in other words, three scripts were greenlit before this particular one. That said, the premise for this episode was in production for much longer than most scripts and numerous rewrites were carried out on this particular script. One of the most unique aspects of the debut episode of He-Man is that it aired in the United Kingdom before it aired in its country of origin, the United States of America. A fact that these days would have us scratching our heads, but it's true. He-Man first aired in the UK on September the 5th, 1983, and a few weeks later on the 26th of September 1983 in the United States of America. It baffles me to this day how this tiny little country I live in somehow aired the cartoon first. However, to put everything into context, even though the cartoon had completed airing all 130 episodes in the USA by December of 1985, the UK's protracted way of airing cartoons in the 80s resulted in us still getting new episodes in early 1988. In short, whereas it took the USA two years to see all the episodes of the series, it took the UK a whopping five years to see the entire series. Imagine that. In one of the earliest drafts of this script, the title of the episode was in fact simply The Diamond of Disappearance. Methinks the word ray was added to make it sound more like a weapon than a simple pretty diamond. Not only that, but the artifact itself was originally referred to as the Lost Stone of Souls, a rather terrifying moniker I'm sure you'll agree. This episode was written by Robbie London who I honestly think never gets enough credit for his work on the series. Even though freelance writer Michael Halperin had penned the series Bible for Mattel, Robbie London took Halperin's beautifully written Bible went through all of the material and revised it in places, changing certain things like Prince Adam having to strike the Sword of Power against Stone in order to transform into He-Man. Robbie London's vision for the world of Eternia and the cast of characters that inhabit it is what we see across this animated series. During these early days of production there was a great deal of development work still happening at both Mattel and Filmation. Thus when Robbie London wrote the initial draft, all of the evil warriors that we would come to know and love were not actually available to him. For a start, in the earliest development of the Filmation series, the villains were known as the evil masters of the universe, something that Filmation were pushing for. At some point the decision was made that the term masters of the universe, at least in the Filmation show, would refer to the vast array of wonderful characters. Though personally I love the idea of the villains calling themselves the masters of the universe. It's incredibly self-congratulatory. We're the masters of the universe. Going back to Robbie London's lineup of villains, Merman, Trapjaw and Triclops were present in his original script, but also included were Dragoon, yes Dragoon, who would later show up in another Robbie London penned script, Dawn of Dragoon, as one of Skeletor's henchmen, Desira, who was for a time the original witch, villainess, goddess for the animated series before Evil Lynn made her presence fell, and the six-armed Octus. Octus, he just sounds amazingly cool. Sadly, no production art of Octus has ever surfaced and I've seen a lot of development artwork for the series, but no Octus. As production of this episode moved forward, Robbie London revised the script numerous times so that the final lineup of characters would be the ones you see before you in this episode. For the longest time I would argue with people that this roll call of villains was one of the most blatant pieces of toy advertising I'd ever seen in a cartoon from the 1980s. But in truth, given the series tended to avoid blatant advertising due to the wonderful deal that Filmation President Lou Scheimer had in place with Mattel, which meant that Lou didn't have to include any of Mattel's proposed new toys, I tend to revise my original trail of thought about this episode being a blatant toy advert. Granted, the only thing missing is a piece of dialogue from Skeletor saying, Tricolapse, Master of Vision, available in all good stores for $2.99. That said, this is a pilot episode that is attempting to introduce an entire cast of characters, so what other ways are there of doing so? 
If you weren't explicitly naming the characters or what they were there to do, it would lead to a great deal of confusion. Like, who's that guy? Who's she? How did he do that? And one of the most interesting aspects of the exchanges in this opening scene is that we learn that the war between the forces of good and evil has been going on for many years. This is not the first time that the evil warriors have been summoned by Skeletor, nor will it be the last. This is good because it gives us a kind of history and great depth to the plot before the episode has really even begun. You get the sense that much has occurred on Eternia prior to this, our initial visit. In stark contrast to each evil warrior being name checked, in this scene at the Royal Palace we are introduced to the characters, rightly so, as a family. It would have been bizarre to see King Randall name check each of the heroes as they appeared on camera. How you entertain me, Orko, heroic court magician from the magical land of Trala. That just wouldn't have worked. In this scene in which Orko's egg trick goes wrong, we have a far more confrontational and gruffer man at arms. Clearly both Robbie London and actor Alan Oppenheimer were trying to get to grips with who this character is, especially with regards to his relationship with Orko. Because it just feels like man at arms is ready to punch Orko in the face at any moment. I should mention that the egg trick we see in this scene would later show up in the form of a flashback in the season 2 episode, The Secret of Greyskull. In that episode, the scene ends somewhat differently with Man at Arms sending the naughty little troll into his room and then admitting he never would have been able to laugh at himself had he never met Orko. Trapjaw's attack on the Royal Palace would partially be reused in the episode Quest for He-Man, though on that particular occasion he is accompanied by Triclops. This scene at the palace does beautifully showcase the characters and how they interact with one another. We have Orko getting on the wrong side of Man at Arms, the hot headed Teela racing into battle, and of course, Prince Adam and his cowardly cat, Cringer, leaving the drama with his father, King Randor, showing great disappointment. Everything is perfectly set in place by Robbie London's script. This is how the characters are going to be throughout the series. And now we have the transformation sequence, by far one of the most incredibly animated sequences created by Filmation, and I'd argue one of the most iconic animated sequences of the 1980s. No computers were involved, everything was patiently created in camera with the film being run back through the camera numerous times and the film both masked off and exposed in a number of ways in order to achieve the layers and all that you see occurring during Prince Adam's transformation into He-Man. Animation is so often taken for granted, but this sequence is a genuine technical masterpiece. The storyboards of this sequence were created by the legendary artist Bob Klein. Bob Klein also worked on notable things such as the introduction sequence to Marvel Productions' Dungeons & Dragons, as well as storyboarding many cartoons of the 1980s. He was, and still is, a highly respected artist amongst his peers. Here's something for you to chew on, Trapjaw! I should talk about the music specifically for this episode. As this episode was very early in production, not all of the music for the show had been completed by the great Shooky Levy, so you'll notice certain somewhat unique musical cues in this episode. These tracks, specifically two of them, were composed prior to the He-Man series by Shooky Levy and actually used on another Japanese production that made its way to the West a year or two earlier, completely unrelated to filmation. Thankfully, even no one bothered to check or some agreements were in place and the music remained in this episode and would actually pop up in Teela's Quest too, another episode very early on in the production of the series. This episode also features the only on-screen appearance of Skeletor's rather awesome battle axe. The reason for this weapon's appearance in this episode, and no other, is that at the time of production, Skeletor's Havoc staff had not yet been designed for animation, and so Filmation simply took the model design for He-Man's axe and gave it to Skeletor. It's a shame it was never used again as the weapon was rather impressive and gave the Lord of Destruction a somewhat more aggressive look. This episode is the only time in the series we see Trapjaw having problems with his arm attachments. Robbie London had planned to revisit this gag of him having problems replacing his weapon in the episode Double-Edged Sword, but this scene was sadly cut for time. Mm. Trapjaw's voice in this episode is something I feel I should highlight. Lou Scheimer was the voice of Trapjaw throughout the series, but here, those in charge of sound were not quite sure what to do with the voice, and Trapjaw sounds more robotic, lighter, and far less guttural than what we would come to expect from Trapjaw. Oddly, Trapjaw's final appearance will be in the She-Ra episode Assault on the Hive. I say oddly because in that episode his voice changes once again to a ridiculous, deep, almost hard to understand voice. 
So yeah, it's odd that Trapjaw's first and last appearances in the He-Man and She-Ra cartoon universe have him with a different voice to his normal voice. Originally, in the script, Teela pursued Trapjaw on the battle ram, not just aboard the Sky Sled. This is why in the episode, He-Man tells Teela to put her battle ram in high gear and head back home when she's clearly piloting the Sky Sled. Back at the Royal Palace, it's as if the King and Queen, Man, Arms and Orko haven't even moved since the attack began. You'd think they would all be moved to some sort of safety bunker or something. That said, Orko isn't bothered and still wants to entertain and Man, Arms still wants to inflict damage upon Orko. <laughs> It's so funny watching this episode and watching one later in the series, Man at Arms definitely, thankfully, softens his attitude towards Orko. You can tell this is an early episode when you see the Harbringer of Doom, Zor the Falcon. In a lot of the earlier episodes, the sorceress, in her guise of Zor the Falcon, would warn the heroes of danger, whereas in the later episodes, the sorceress would often communicate with Prince Adam or Man at Arms via a telepathic signal, which was surely far easier. For those that don't know, prior to the Filmation series, the Sorceress did not exist, and Zor the Falcon was merely a fighting falcon that would aid the heroes from time to time. Filmation believed that the Goddess, a character used by Mattel in a lot of the early material, should play a vital role in the series, but look a lot less like Teela. They decided to make Zor the Falcon the Sorceress's alternate form, which, when you sit down and think about it, makes a lot of sense in terms of storytelling. An early illustration of the Sorceress by Filmation has very little resemblance to the character we come to know in the series, with the Falcon costume being a later change to the character design. So coming up we have an interesting scene. Back in the mid 90s, when Hallmark acquired the Filmation library, they sensibly decided to create a digital library, restoring the episodes where possible. However, in the restoration of Diamond Ray of Disappearance, something went wrong and any and all subsequent digital releases of this episode were missing the scene after which Skeletor uses the Diamond of Disappearance to make Zor, the King and Queen and Man at Arms vanish. Those of us that had the prior VHS releases of the episode knew that the scene was missing, but for many, there was some confusion as to how Orko simply got away. And if you had paid close attention back then, there was no end of Act 1. And honestly, the end of Act 1 with Skeletor revealing his plan to attack Castle Greyskull is a rather awesome one. Actually, you'll notice one thing about this episode. What has happened to Triclops? Yes, you'll see him return soon, but for some reason he is written out of the episode for a time. And I always feel sorry for Triclops. He was cast alongside this group of evil warriors, making him one of the famous first five. And yet, out of 130 episodes, Triclops shows up a grand total of 10 times. 10 times. <laughs> In this scene in which Orko talks to Hina, notice how Orko is animated and even illustrated in certain static frames. The style of the character seems to vary wildly. Even though Filmation had model sheets for the character, instructing the animators on how to make the character look, it's one thing to say, here's how he looks, it's another to actually make the character move. At this point in production, the animators were clearly still trying to figure out how to work with Orko. I mean, it's easy to animate a human in the sense that you know exactly what a human body does. However, imagine being an animator, being handed a model sheet and told that you have to make Orko react and move as he talks. Your first question would probably be, what the hell is this thing? I actually like to refer to Orko as wonky in this episode, and trust me, it's not a bad thing. Here we have the memorable scene in which He-Man, a top battle cat, commands the jawbridge of Castle Greyskull to lower. It's an incredibly dramatic and powerful scene and was reused in another Robbie London episode, Double-Edged Sword. However, in that scene, it's far less dramatic. There's a shot coming up in which He-Man stands in front of the window of spirits. We see his feet, but no dialogue is uttered. However, the dialogue is actually present, but the audio mix was somehow incorrectly processed. As He-Man stands in front of the Window of Spirits, in reference to the Sorceress, he actually utters the line, Maybe we can reach her in the Window of Spirits, before walking towards the magical floating mirror. Talking about the music once again, you'll notice that the theme song plays quite a bit during this episode, usually in dramatic or action-packed scenes. Interestingly, this was at the request of writer Robbie London, who writes in the script at certain points that the He-Man theme should play, which indicates that the theme was either already composed prior to a particular rewrite of the script, or that Robbie knew that a dramatic heroic theme was being composed for the show. 
I have to talk briefly about what Filmation were able to create visually for this series. For the criticism they receive for stock animation, which I actually think creates a consistent style throughout the series, and not many cartoons of the 1980s can say that, Filmation's background artist was simply incredible. They created an entire fantasy world, crafting such beautifully unique visuals that make it almost impossible for we, the audience, to look away for a second. There are no greater shots in the series than those nighttime backgrounds, as the shadows and weird, almost organic structures present to us a planet that seems to be bursting with magic, even if it does feel a tad foreboding at times. And the music used in these scenes really does add to the sense of wonderment. I always chuckle at this scene, Skeletor's plan in this episode, for the most part, is very interesting. He somehow retrieves the magical diamond of disappearance, and with it plans to conquer the planet of Eternia and rule. However, regardless of all of that, his ultimate plan to conquer Castle Greyskull is by using a hook and a rope to pull the jawbridge down. There's just something so wonderfully silly about that. Also, when you think about it, Skeletor's confidence must be at an all-time high here. After all, he has no knowledge that the sorceress is gone, and he is unaware that He-Man awaits him inside. As we saw in the opening scene, the villains seem more than aware how frustratingly powerful He-Man is. In the original storyboards for this episode, as it was the very first one being worked on, there are some notable differences, usually in the action scenes. Bob Klein, who storyboarded numerous key scenes in this episode, actually had He-Man punch Beastman, knocking the villain back after he charges at the most powerful man in the universe. Of course, this was a huge no-no. Formation could not have He-Man punch another character, although he does in another Robbie London script, though it occurs off camera. I'll let you all find that scene on your own. The sequence in which He-Man dodges Merman's attack and throws the ocean warlord high into the sky is reused in two other episodes. In the episode Evil Lynn's plot, He-Man throws Merman whilst fighting him within the Widget's fortress, and in the episode The Time Corridor, Merman is replaced by Olo, the leader of Eternia's ancient ape clan. Teela and Evil Lynn squaring off is never a bad thing, and I highly recommend checking out the episode The Witch and the Warrior, penned by Paul Dini, in which the two females must coexist in the desert. It's fantastic. That animation of He-Man running into shot, swinging his sword and running out of shot was initially animated just for this episode. However, during the production of He-Man, and because they loved working on the show so much, Filmation's storyboard department created their own additional stock animation system called Same As. Any time a piece of animation in the storyboard was brought to life with great effect, the storyboard department would enter it into a folder. Same As sequences allowed Filmation to keep the episode budget down, but also enabled the episodes to get constantly stronger visually as the series progressed. And this is very true when you compare many season one episodes to what Filmation were visually accomplishing come season two. You fight, Skeletor. <laughs> as you wish, He-Man. And now we have He-Man facing off against Skeletor for the first time in this episode. When Skeletor ducks the diamond ray, you'll notice that the animator does something that was rarely employed by Filmation, though usually expected of animation departments. We see Skeletor's skull become expressive. This was something that Filmation often avoided in order to keep Skeletor's appearance menacing, rather than a comical skull that could bend and react. Only a few times in the He-Man and She-Ra series does Skeletor's skull actually emote. Here we see Skeletor seemingly losing his patience and the Diamond of Disappearance, only to suddenly, rather randomly, bring a piece of rock to life, which He-Man effortlessly takes care of. I don't even think He-Man broke into a sweat in that scene. I have to go back and say that I do love humorless Skeletor. I often point people to these earlier episodes of the series when the writers were writing the Lord of Destruction and many villains without a sense of humour. As has been mentioned, when the writers began to see episodes produced with audio, upon hearing Alan Oppenheimer's take on Skeletor, they decided to inject some humour into the character. In fairness, numerous Saturday morning villains around the same time would have humour in their personalities, even if it was twisted and cruel. Again, these backgrounds of the evergreen forest at night are simply beautiful. The twisting trees, the colours, they make Eternia feel like a truly unique and magical place. And yes, he-Man is about to retrieve the Diamond of Disappearance, but rather surprisingly it won't be an easy task for the most powerful man in the universe. This sequence is a highly memorable one, one of those scenes that almost transcends the series with the most casual of fans remembering this scene. The theme song once more plays a rather important role in this scene, really showcasing He-Man's great strength and his ability to save the day. In the script when He-Man disappears, whilst in the mysterious other dimension, 
He observes the location with shock, only to continue crushing the diamond. Once again, you have fulfilled your destiny, He-Man. He-Man, thank goodness you freed us. And Skeletor somehow is now quite a distance away as he utters the first of many final threats, though this is one of the most memorable as he stands with his awesome battle axe in hand. He-Man breaks the diamond and everyone is freed. Hooray! That said, one question we find ourselves asking. What happened to the lizard that Skeletor used the diamond of disappearance on? Did the lizard return? We see no evidence of the poor creature returning. I feel that we should have a moment's silence for the creature. Prince Adam told me he would make a special effort not to be late. The final scene at the Royal Palace kind of shows the structure of an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe going forward. Not that it was common, but it wasn't uncommon either to have the heroes gathered in the throne room, reflecting on the events of the day with some sort of conclusion or lesson, followed by Orko saying something or doing something that made the characters laugh. There's no harm in this, but it is one of those things that casual fans believed happened in every episode, much like Skeletor's use of the word boob. Skeletor said boob twice in the series, and yet the modern take on Skeletor is that he said it in every episode. <laughs> well, but at least he destroyed them on time. <laughs> <laughs> I should talk about this episode overall. Robbie London accomplished a great deal with this script. He was the first writer to actually pen an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, as well as developing the existing series Bible and setting the tone for the Filmation cartoon. There were numerous writers in the development of He-Man, Paul Dini, Michael Reeves, but Robbie London in those early days really did craft the cartoon that we have all come to know and love. In this episode, Robbie London not only creates the structure of an episode of He-Man, but also showcases a plethora of characters and how some of those characters going forward will interact with one another. As pilot episodes go, he did a fantastic job of introducing everything all at once without making us feel like we are drowning in Mattel's product. This episode may have a few faults, but that is primarily because this episode's mission is unlike any other episode. It's the one episode that 129 other episodes will follow. Let us salute Robbie London for doing something very special with this script. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe, and I shall catch you on the next one. Bye.